Without any further delay, coming to tonight's session on advocating better customer experiences using behavioral game therapy. Let me give you an introduction to our distinguished and eminent speaker of tonight, Jeffrey Dunlark. Jeffrey is a behavioral theorist, speaker, presenter, lecturer, and researcher. He is a user experience strategist focusing on design for extraordinary users in non-office based environments. Jeffrey's research focus is on behavioral game theory and how it can be applied for designer problems by focusing on designer agencies to improve their ability to sell the design to stakeholders and multidisciplinary teams to realize impactful user experiences. A very warm welcome to you, Jeffrey. We are delighted to have you here with us tonight. Jeffrey, you need to unmute yourself. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Great. Welcome aboard. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Handing the uh, session over to you. I'm going to stop sharing and you can, uh, okay, start with the session. Okay. So I take it away then. Uh, all right, uh, everyone. Good evening. Uh, uh, good morning for me, but good evening for you. So today, yeah, I'm really excited to talk about game theory and you know customer experience design. You know, these are two of my like favorite areas, and you're probably wondering, you know, what maybe does behavioral game theory or social psychology have to do with design? And you know, we'll answer those questions as we go through here. So. Uh, so first thing we'll start out to get everyone sort of level set, you know, what is game theory? And game theory was derived in the uh, 1940s by economists as a way to determine, you know, outputs and like outcomes. And it's a design of strategic decision making, you know, between rational players. And the focus area of my, my research partner Lubna and I is around behavioral game theory. And this is where we kind of joke it's or and behavioral game theory, social psychologists, you know, call this the idea of strategic decision-making between irrational players. And so if we think about that, you know, first of all, players are yourself and anyone you interact with. And so taking this, you know, game idea, uh, they can be in social and psychological situations. But the question is, are players really irrational? You know, and there's a, a CIA analyst and behavioral game theorist, uh, Boris Bueno de Mesquita, who always joked in a TED talk I watched, he said the only two people or players in life that are irrational are terrorists and three-year-olds. And everyone else in a game, you know, we assume they're rational and where they may appear irrational is simply because of their motivations. And so today I'm gonna to use the word motivations a lot as we explore, you know, the different topics and aspects of this, you know, uh, games. And so today with that, though, we're going to cover two games. The first one is a cooperative equilibrium game called Prisoner's Dilemma. And this game is just very common. It's a primer. So if you take a game theory 101 class or an economist class, you know, 101 or something like that, and they talk about game theory, Prisoner's Dilemma is kind of the way, you know, it starts out to introduce game theory. And then we'll look at a couple other games, uh, hopefully you're familiar to you, and we'll look then at the idea of, you know, coordination assurance. This is where, you know, you could ask the question, okay, what does game theory have to do with design? We're gonna, you know, we'll explore that quite a bit in design advocacy. The, the two words though, to take away from this screen, of course, is cooperative and coordination, because these are very, you know, in, in very important things, you know, in terms of like game theory and how we apply these games. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Prisoner's Dilemma. So the prisoner's dilemma goes something like this. Uh, you and your mate decide to knock over a bank, you know, rob a bank, and you, you're successful and you seem to make what appears to be a clean getaway. Uh, but lo and behold, the police catch you. And like classic uh, 
you know, crime television, we're all familiar with crime drama, crime television. They, you know, and it's a very classic plot to most crime dramas, right? Is they then take you and your partner and they separate you into two different interrogation rooms. Now, this is where the game begins. And so uh, game theory is divided into decisions and outcomes. And so and based on strategy, you know, and very much like chess. I mean, how many of you have uh, seen The Queen's Gambit, you know, on Netflix and the show and, and the different decisions she made both on the chess board in the game and outside the game. But, you know, so here you're in, you're in this room. And so the police, they know, the police tell you that they don't have enough evidence to convict you fully. You know, maybe they, they have enough to caught you because you ran several red lights in your getaway or you, you know, you drove recklessly. And so they'll put you down in a room and they give you two choices, uh, remain silent or confess. And this is, as I said, classic police, you know, drama. And so they're, the police are banking on the idea that because you're separated, they can start to, you know, work on you uh, against each other, turn you against each other. And so you're, what would appear to be the best solution because the police have told you, hey, we don't have enough you know, to, you know, to convict you on the bank robbery. Maybe they didn't find the cash or something like that. Your best course of action would appear to remain silent because if, they, if you remain silent, you and your, if both you and your partner remain silent, you're gonna look at maybe a year jail or a, a year less, you know, a year or less of jail, which is a pretty good deal. The thing is, is how sure are you that your partner is going to agree to this. And so, and what the police will try to do as their strategy is say, hey, if you confess against your partner, you get to go free and then your partner will get 10 years. The problem is, is as you start to see this developing in the other room, the other detective or you know, police officer inspector is going to give your partner the same deal. Hey, if you confess, you'll, you know, that person will go free and then you are gonna look at 10 years in jail. And so the police are in this sort of game and strategy, the police's strategy is to play you off against each other. And then, so you both confess. And if you both confess, well, you know, for the police, you know, it's, it's three years, you each suffer three years in jail and that's their optimal outcome. But the thing is in this game, it's important to remember like in this prisoner's dilemma is you're not playing the game against the police, you're playing the game against your partner and trying to anticipate what your partner is going to do and so the police are banking on this, this three years of, you know, that you're going to confess. And so when you consider your options, remain silent or confess, although remain silent would have been your absolutely best option, your best option for the best outcome is going to be to confess. And, you know, and that's the secret behind, you know, police tactics. And when you both confess, that's called a Nash equilibrium. And we'll cover that specifically in a second. Um, but because we're designers and we're product managers and we use a lot of like researchers and we use a lot of heuristics, you know, we'll look at these, we're going to look at two heuristics now. They'll kind of like set the tone for the rest of the game. The first is to understand what a pure strategy is. And this is where you have many strategies, you know, optional to you, but you choose the best one and you can't mix it because you're, you're solely in one, you have one choice here in the sense of like in the police interrogation room, your two choices really are confess, remain silent. There's, there's you know, nothing else you can do. Um, and of course, with that, once you've done one or the other, you know, in theory, in, in that moment, without a good lawyer, you have like one or done, you know, it's a, it's a one time choice. And generally your peer strategy is the one your best chance for success. So there was a poll there, we're gonna, you know, ask like, how many of you would have remained silent? How many of you would have confessed? Uh, the second heuristic, and this was created by John Nash, um, uh, you know, and the Nash equilibrium. And this is where the optimal outcome of the game is where one player had no incentive to deviate, you know, from your chosen strategy. And, and again, think of like chess with this and like how you strategize, you know, based on your opponent's choice or what their potential choice can be. Uh, this will, you know, well, as we get more into the UX side of it, this will be, you know, really important in design advocacy. So now we're going to look at a, a slightly more involved game and then talk just lightly about the mathematics because games, games are based on algorithms and mathematics. Um, and so, you know, with that, we'll look at a very common and popular game. So how many of you have ever played Piper, Rock, and Scissors? 
And you know that, you know, paper beats rock, rock beats scissors, scissors beats paper, and hopefully everyone's familiar with this game. Uh, and so the mathematics, you know, like the remain silent table, this table just, the numbers, you know, just mean like zero is a draw. You get a point if you win and a minus point. And, but the thing with paper, rocks, and scissors now is it's a strategy game that's played over and over again. Like my brother and I used to play this game all the time. And we would, you know, I would do a lot of papers uh, because I knew he would do a lot of rocks. But the moment he threw in a scissors, you know, my reputation, I started to become unpredictable. So reputation is another key point here is when you do something over and over again, you gain a reputation, either positive or negative. And so, you know, with this game, you know, it, it's a way to start building reputation and reputation building. Uh, and so that's maybe, a, so we'll get to our, our third heuristic now, which is a mixed strategy. And a mixed strategy is where you can use your, either of your strategies, in this case, there were three of them, paper, rock, and scissors, but you mix them up with some probability to try to gain an advantage so that you appear, you know, maybe predictable, though, maybe lure them into a trap. And that sounds kind of, you know, evil, but, but the idea is, you know, to, to constantly be predictable or unpredictable. And you would utilize this, you know, when there are multiple rounds of play. And it's important in reputation. And so reputation and motivation, as I said before, these are going to be, as we go into this a little deeper, are more and more going to be the same, you know, elements, you know, and sense of leverage and building power. And so reputation is important. Like take an example of uh, Walmart. Uh, if you're familiar with the company, Walmart, Walmart has a huge reputation and they can leverage where in the store their products go and there's a science to it. And the layout to shelves, you know, shelf space, uh, what goes on the shelves, you know, where are things located in the store, whether they're towards the entrance, towards the checkouts, you know, are they buried further in? A lot of department stores, you know, use this layout and this, you know, based on their reputation to determine products. And so when you're trying to sell something at scale, say in Walmart, your reputation affects how much shelf space they're going to give you. Uh, if you're Procter & Gamble, for example, you have you know, a lot of reputation in your own sense. You have a lot of leverage and bargaining power. You can kind of dictate where in the stores your products are going to go. But as a company, you know, remember in the years I worked for this company in New York and we were making toys, uh, we didn't have that reputation. And so when we were meeting with the Walmart uh, you know, execs or, you know, I, I guess layout folks or store, store design folks. Uh, it was determining where we we're going to put our products. And, you know, we had these, um, you can imagine like products that just are in what are called blister packs and they hang on a shelf. And so for us, we were given a very small shelf space, even though our product was uh, Spider-Man and a few other Marvel Cinematic Universe characters. Uh, we still didn't have the reputation and we were risky. They didn't know us well. And so they weren't going to give us a lot of shelf space in case the product didn't sell because it, it was these electronic discs, uh, you know, like multimedia disc things. And so we had to try in our side because we didn't have the reputation. We had to try to design to, you know, make the product packaging as, as shiny and as glossy as possible to attract attention. You know, and it was a it was a challenge to, of course, to get that shelf space. And as we built reputation, and as you know, the product started to sell, we could renegotiate. You know, where in the store we were going to put that product, uh, as an example. And so, why we why we look at all these things is because everything we do in life is a social decision making process, and personal and professional decisions that we make are, you know, strategy. And this can be anything from you know. What, what I'm going to have for breakfast in the morning or me like, you know, drinking coffee because it's real early here and I wanted to become peppy to, you know, what we're going to do in life. Like say we walk into a crowded room or we walk into a bar or something like that. Or we, we get invited. If you remember back in college or something, hopefully, you know, we we're invited to a party. And we didn't know anyone there. And so we look at strategies like what we're going to do when we first walk in that room. You know, we, we scan the room and sometimes we may do a lap. Sometimes we you know, may not and just to familiarize ourselves with the room. Sometimes we may go for a drink or we may go for something to eat first. And, and some of us may just, you know, look at the right, per, you know, find that person that we want to talk to. So we scan the room and we look for who's the person that's most approachable, especially if we don't know anyone. And we went to this party stag or solo. And there's a strategy to that, that we do subconsciously make these decisions every, you know, every day. 
And as we're scanning that room of people, you know, what, what about them makes them feel approachable or safe? You know, where, you know, saving the sense of like, not going to get rejected or not going to ignore us or kind of humiliate us and make us feel foolish. Now, if we, you know, and so we, we, we play these decisions out in our head, right? Or if we go to a conference, uh, this conference is online, but, you know, a lot of in-person con you know, in conferences, if you go, you know, like I do often, I, I go to a lot of like IXD conferences or conferences, you know, without anyone that I know, like no colleagues, no friends. And so I, I play these games over and over in my head, like, who do I want to talk to if it's like a happy hour or like a, a break with food? Which table looks like they're the friendliest I can go mix with, you know? And, and so, you know, it's a different dynamic, of course, if we go with somebody. Like, say we go with a colleague or a friend, decision-making becomes less, maybe less difficult, right? Because we've got that kind of backup. You know, we can always like, you know, hang out with our colleague or our friend. I was never can we ditch our colleague or our friend if someone else looks more interested in the room. But you kind of get the idea here that, you know, these decisions become, you know, more and more apparent. And it's the same in professional, like as a designer, as a, you know, product manager, as a researcher, uh, you know, who do you approach in your company to make, you know, sell your idea, to make your idea? You know, and we're going to touch upon that a little bit, you know, deeper in the conversation of the UX design and advocacy game. And we practice social cognition, right, through our moves. And so all these things we're doing, we're constantly learning and we're constantly realizing ourselves. We learn more and more about ourselves. We learn more and more about other people, you know, through social cognition. And oftentimes we, we create, you know, these social and professional decision makings with or without any of the facts. Uh, one of the other examples I'll use is say you're in a bar and you want to like get, you find someone there attractive and you want to like pick up them, you know, get their phone number or something like that. And there's a lot of things you may do ahead of time before you even approach the person. Do you start with a, a cheesy pickup line? Do you start with a joke? Do you start with like, you know, maybe a game like, hey, my, you know, and my, my son laughed at me about this one because it's, it's kind of an old thing and I don't recommend him trying this, but, you know, going up to somebody and saying, Hey, my friend's bad. I couldn't get your phone number, you know, just write anything down on a paper, you know, or something like that, just to like, you know, maybe prove a point. But the idea is that as you go and you start to maybe approach that person, you know, you may not know an example, right, is you may not know if they're married or if they're single or, if, you know, something else or whatever. And so we often, you know, this is kind of an idea of like a social situation with where we go and move forward without maybe all the facts. And a lot of us in our professional careers, we do this a lot, especially design, right? Until we've done research, until we prove things, you know, we often just design things based on our instinct and based on, you know, what we think the user will want or what the user needs. And even with a, you know, product, you know, as we design that, we'll, you know, and of course then we test it out and things, but often when we do these things, you know, we, we have, well, hopefully we'll make mistakes. Everyone makes mistakes. Sometimes we're successful, uh, but hopefully we learn from our mistakes. And then we don't, you know, keep doing the same thing over and over again, you know, hoping for a different result. And yeah, so now as we think about these things too, uh, this, when I put together this talk uh, and Lubin and I, you know, started this idea and this talk, uh, Tony Stark was one of the people that came up to us, you know, constantly as we started, you know, as we were researching and looking through, you know, different elements of our own professional, you know, lives in particular in the various companies we work for. And so Tony Stark, if we remember the Avengers movie, Avengers movies, uh, the one that always stuck out to me was Age of Ultron. Because Tony, you know, in his brilliance and infinite wisdom and quite ego, right, being a, a billionaire, uh, he never, ever stopped to think about you know, long-term consequences. Uh, Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park, you know, Ian Malcolm's character said, you know, our scientists, you know, knew they could, but they never stopped to think if they should. Uh, Tony Stark was the same way. He, you know, took this technology he had captured from Hydra and against, you know, even Bruce warning him, even Jarvis, the computer warning him, he kept going and kept pushing and without actually thinking of long-term unintended consequences, and then, of course, he created Ultron, and that had a, a spiraling effect that, you know, affected some of the other movies. And so as we look now into our, our last game, uh, you know, it, it's important to, like, you know, I, I guess, you know, think of Tony Stark. So coordination assurance and design advocacy. So why I got into the game, you know, why I decided to apply game theory to, you know, design it problems is because 
over and over again, you know, as I, I pitch my own work and as I watch colleagues pitch their work and as we watch, you know, and, and other people and, and like field research and things like that, I kept seeing designers, you know, doing the same things over and over again. And to moderate, sometimes very good success, sometimes not so good success. And so, you know, we started thinking about that. So let's, let's think about, first of all, what coordination assurance is. And coordination assurance is a, is a cooperative game where we choose the same moves or react in semi-predictable ways as a social standard. And in game theory, there are two types of games, cooperative games and uncooperative games. Uncooperative games are where life is you know, chaos. And so, you know, the example could be kind of like war, but even war has a set of like rules. Um, so the best example of uncooperative games is say terrorism. Because terrorism, there is no rules. There, there's no seemingly logic behind it. Um, you know, for argument's sake, there probably, you know, could be, but to keep it simple, it's just an idea of like where there's just total chaos and things are very unpredictable. A cooperative game, which is where most game theory lies, at least outside of like maybe national security and, and military things, but just everyday social and psycho, you know, professional situations are cooperative games. And cooperative games just mean there's, there's a loose set of rules and sometimes they're defined rules. Uh, sometimes it's just social standards, you know, that we all adhere to. And so an example of this, uh, you know, standard set of rules is traffic. And in India, you, you know, people drive on one side of the road and like in the UK and Australia and in South Africa, places like that. And in the United States, you know, we drive on the opposite side of the road. So if you imagine for a minute, they're, and they're both a standard set of rules. I mean, you know, although traffic you know, can be interesting in both places, uh, maybe more so in India, you know, just based on the experience there. Uh, we still agree to a rough set of rules, you know, like no one's going to hopefully not well, drive on the opposite side of the road. But if you were to merge both, say overnight, like America and India were both emerged together and we laid, you know, one on top of each other and instantly combined, you know, what do you think would happen, you know, in, in the sense of the traffic? And I think we have a poll there too, is what do you think would happen, you know, and all of a sudden, like, because we drive on the opposite side of the road, you know, you know, even though we're both in the right, we're both correct on the side of the road we drive into, it can be very disastrous results. And of course, another, you know, and then the other example to this is um, uh, traffic, you know, traffic lights. And that's a standard set of rules that, you know, red stop, green go, yellow caution, uh, you know, is, is the same across all of the world, right? We all adhere to the same kind of traffic idea as a, you know, as a set of rules. And yeah. And so as we think about this now, okay, now as UX professionals, you know, that's sort of the game theory primer. Now as UX professionals, we spend a lot of time, you know, perfecting our craft. We come to conferences, we, you know, we, we take these seminars, we're, we're constantly learning, we're, you know, researching and in school and professionally, everything teaches us about human centered design, design thinking and even product owners, product managers, you know, everything is about humans because we're ultimately as professionals, we are designing for humans and end users, customers, and we employ design thinking to solve these problems. And we also, you know, to validate and back up our design, our research, you know, we do research and we validate, you know, every every sort of sun, you know every sort of situation and you know we create customer journey maps we create affinity maps we you know we build all these like you know collateral artifacts and then you know test 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 and then you know where where the you know designers are often joked as the people with the most empathy and i think rightly so because we really do care about humans and that's why we got into design so we apply these environmental and psychological dimensions you know and and the environmental, uh, by that, I mean, like, are you designed for, you know, people in an office, are you designed for people outside the office? And if, especially if you're outside in the wild, outside, you know, in the office place, do you, you know, are there considerations of you know, temperature or size? Like one of the products I had designed one time was, you know, for people that were in very cold climates. And so trying to use gloves with tablets and things like that. Um, you know, these are all the elements that we work out with and th that because we get do this quite a bit, we like Tony Stark, 
you know, start to gain, you know, a bit of ego and a bit of light, which probably rightly so, because we become the expert in this area. The problem is, is then we take all this design and we take all this research and we go and present that to our stakeholders or our colleagues, you know, developers, QA, PMs. And we look at unintended consequences and we look at dark patterns. And often, when, you know, how many of you, you know, have thought about this as you've gone to pitch an idea to people, you know, how was it received and, and what, you know, happened in that room? And the idea of this talk was doing some of this field research and, and starting to talk to people. Uh, we found there was a pattern emerging that it became very hard. And often we end up like this, like my poor colleagues here. You know, they thought they had the perfect solution and it was rejected. And hopefully, you know, throughout giving this talk and throughout like talking to people, there's obviously various levels of success here. Some people are like, yeah, I experienced this once in a while, maybe because I worked at Apple or something. And other people are like, yeah, this happens to me a lot. And for me and people I noticed, it, it happens quite a bit. And often because we forget, um, you know, the larger narrative, like we forget and understand everyone around us. I mean, we care about design, but that doesn't hold true to all of our colleagues. And hence, you know, why this talk, because I found that designers, you know, myself included my colleagues, we often forget to consider our, the rest of our team's motivations. And by that, you know, it's, it's the idea of, you know, now thinking, what are the other people's person's motivations? It's very intuitive to say, Everyone at the company is there to make the company money. We're there to, you know, do what's best for our customers and our users and, you know, and what's best for the company, you know, every, every single team member. But we know in reality, that's not true. You know, people have a lot of motivations for and different things. And some, you know, often what's found, and hopefully this is resonating, is that the motivations of developers or PMs, you know, like, you know, technical project managers aren't the same as product owners or product managers or designers, you know, they have very different motivations and the way they want to like go about their work. And so often that leaves us asking, are they rational motivations? Like, you know, if people don't seem to be working in the best interest of the customer or user, you know, it's designers are like, that's their rational. Like why, you know, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, we're here to make, you know, the best thing we can for the customer. And this is often where I think, you know, design, uh, you know, fails and because we consider the motivations of our users and end users, but we don't consider the motivations of the people we were working with to help us build this, these products. And so and this is the hardest part I've found that, you know, designers in particular user experience professionals have and is this idea that, you know, who makes the arbitrary of logic, you know, we were, it's our profession to look out for the user, the customer. Not everyone else has that requirement or that luxury. I mean, they should, because they're paid to do a job, but often they don't, you know? And so let's explore why. So as designers, you know, my friends, all of you, you know, there's two truths and Luna's gonna say like, hey, it's, a, you know, you're an easy target to ignore. And, and getting back to reputation, if all we're ever talking about is customer, you know, customer this, customer that, user this, user that, well, it's valid and it's true, often it makes you easier to ignore and like, you know, design, you know, design this, design that, uh, that reputation, you know, that parroting, you know, just it, sometimes it doesn't work. And I'll pick on devs a little bit, but, you know, a developer's end goal, you know, isn't to make the best designed, easy to use software. It's to, you know, make bug free code. And, you know, and the thing is, I think for a lot of us at design and a lot of places we work, uh, especially if we're starting out and we don't have like a reputation in a company, we're always going to be explained design. I mean, even the design thinking, design concepts, you know, and I mean, that's, that's a very popular topic, I think, in a lot of different conferences, a lot of different meetups, because outside of university, which we we'll all remember university was, it was pretty easy going through as designers, you know, we do some research, we do our homework, we do our work and it was pitched and we didn't really have to answer to anyone except for a professor. And so, but when we get into the real, you know, the, the working world, design is just one of the many elements for a company. And, uh, you know, and more and more companies are realizing design centric and that's good. But until then, you know, we're, we're still kind of fighting an uphill battle. And so that brings us to our last game. And so the last game is going to take some of the, you know, 
uh, it's common. So I'll say this way is there's a lot of different elements to this and there's a lot of different, you know, things that people say and, and do in our team and how we react as designers, you know, in our professional lives and semi-social experiences in work. But uh, what we did was to keep the game simple, this advocacy game, uh, we slimmed it down to like five different uh, elements. And so the purple guy at the top represents everyone else we work with, our frenemies, our colleagues, um, and the five common things that they've said or done. And then I'll present five common sort of strategies, you know, uh, player one, player two here. And then, you know, if the five strategies that are often can be used to mitigate the five, I don't want to say excuses, but the five strategies that, you know, I, I find we're often up against. Uh, so the first one, you know, we kind of already covered is, you know, developers, engineers, sometimes stakeholders, they can just ignore you as a designer. Um, hopefully this doesn't happen to too many people, but in my experience, it happens quite a bit, you know. And so, you know, if you're repeating the same, just the same phrase, design, 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 humans, you know, customers, you do become easy to ignore because you become predictable and they know, you know, what you're going to say. Uh, so. But now slightly maybe more advanced strategies is in the research and talking to people and then listening to, you know, either indirect or sorry, direct observations in the field uh, or, you know, just interviews with designers afterwards. Uh, this is one of the more common phrases. You know, I mean, how many of you ever heard of like don't have time or money to implement your design or your idea? You know, we're under a tight crunch. We need to ship this product. You know, especially if it's like accessibility or if it's dark pattern, you know, awareness of like say dark patterns, things like that, that you know, you're just it's shuffled under the carpet. You know, it's like, yeah, no, no, you know, we just need to shift this. We're just gonna you know, do this. Uh, so that's one, the, this center one takes center because it is really important. And this is the one I think designers have trouble with, uh, you know, some, you know, me included as I started out my career was most your most all your colleagues with few exceptions don't really care about design and they don't care about you know ux because it doesn't affect their social standing their salary their bonuses it doesn't affect you know how what they need to do to get their work done and so it's not personal they just don't care and and that's kind of hard you know again that's like a counterintuitive thing because you know it, it, we, it's the center maybe to our product or service in our company and the next one is, you know, that's very common is customer has to use our product. And this happens a lot in enterprise, especially enterprise, enterprise applications, you know, where good user experience seems to get sort of shuffled under the carpet because the idea is that because they're not, really, maybe not really paying for it, especially if it's internal tools, you know, they're not paying for it. There's no risk that they're gonna not use our product. So we're just gonna, you know, take the easiest course to develop it and, you know, people suffer through this. And this is true with a lot of like internal, like help desk software, internal management software. Uh, I was working at a company a couple of years ago where there was an internal product that had a lot of like, say levers to pull and buttons to push to configure internal systems. And the software was, I mean, it's massive and it was designed originally by developers and so, you know, without the, uh, you know, I guess for argument's sake, you can imagine how it, you know, turned out. And so one of my colleagues was assigned to, you know, with a team, uh, you know, her and a couple of designers uh, were assigned to like make sense of this product. And throughout the course of the design, you know, of course she was constantly struggling with getting, you know, with the product management and getting with the, the stakeholders to change the design and try to simplify the product, you know, for, you know, and, and it just became very difficult. And the, because, you know, even though she was assigned, hey, let's approve this product as a designer, you know, design team, I think you could improve this product. A lot of it was just like, well, it's an internal tool. So, you know, or we're just gonna cut corners and it doesn't matter. And so, you know, that one of the other more, you know, popular examples too of that would be say, argumentally the airline industry, particularly in the United States where, you know, the way seats are designed, the way, you know, the internal interior of the plane is designed, especially in coach, uh, you know, 
doesn't maybe isn't the most well designed, you know, for the customers. But if you want to fly somewhere, it's because flying's faster than driving or trains. You know, you're, it's kind of a right a, a set captured audience, and so you know maybe some of that isn't as well done as say like long haul or international flights. You know, where there's a few more choices, um, and then the other idea is this one is comes up quite a bit too, and uh, and this. You know, where design is hard, design is easier. I've, in my experience, actually had dev managers or developers not want to implement a design I created, uh, even though it tested well, because it was harder. It was going to take longer to implement. And so they would, they, at one point in a series of meetings, they had convinced themselves and rationalized themselves, you know, that the design they were proposing was much better for the user. Uh, and you know, just because it was easier to implement, and that became kind of an you know an uphill struggle. And I feel that happens more often than not. You know, as a way to rationalize. Uh, you know, and of course, you know, every design, good design, can come from every quarter. Uh, you know, we don't own design, but you know, in, in this particular case, sometimes this happens where you know they're just trying to you know, cut, you know, make it faster and cut corners. So now for us. Um, so we have strategies, of course, in, a, in, you know, in the game here to counteract this. And what we, you know, in these things, and I'll explain the numbers in a minute, but you can imagine right now zero is going to be you know, bad, nothing good. Uh, and so the first strategy I've seen designers implement in observations or just in, you know, just my daily professional life was telling them, you, you know, that we know best, that you know best, I know best. And that's because we're designers. We went to school, we're human centered, you know, professionals. We, we must know best, right? We, we absolutely, we have the, we've marketed the corner of the market on design. And how many of you guess like that doesn't go over very well? I mean, you know, in any, any aspect, right? Uh, so now we can look at strategies, but that's a very common one people use. Now we'll get other strategies that, you know, we suggest, uh, that where do work and so the first one is exploring with questions and the idea here is to start to you know remember that your colleagues are human beings with emotions motivations and you know underlying perhaps agendas and they have a certain amount of silence they have a certain amount of like desire to do things and then a certain amount of leverage on their own to to get things done and so your ultimate goal of course is always the user and the customer but at the same time, those same motivations, that same research that we do for users and customers, we need to do for our, with our colleagues. And so explore those questions, like get to know them as people and allow them to get to know you as a person. And so ask them, you know, what are the things that they, they need or what are the things they desire or what is their goals? And so you can start to tailor your, you know, your approach, the way you interact with them to them. And by one of the ways of doing this, of course, is then when you explain the benefits of the, your design to them and, and not, not the benefits designed to the company or to the end user or the users, but actually to them, like how can it help them, you know, save time or how can that help them, you know, gain a promotion, a so better social standing in the company, uh, perhaps, you know, it'll affect their bonus or, you know, as I said, promotions. And, you know, really think about, you know, how you can approach, you know, to their needs or their benefits or the way that they view the world. Uh, and part of doing that, of course, is by using their language. And, you know, we as designers, we have a lot of like acronyms and we have a lot of terms um, and we have a way of speaking with each other, you know, and but of course, devs do too. And so don't PMs and so don't stakeholders and business folks. And so read books, start to like understand, you know, if you're not already, like talk to them about the things that motivate them, like what they need and, and what they, you know, how they talk and how they speak. And, you know, it could be as simple as, you know, knowing what an API means or SDK or, you know, other like server technical processes, but it can also just be, you know, getting in with the group, you know, so to speak. Um, and then you have this one, because when you start working with all of these things, you start to build your reputation, you know, and when you start out at a company, 
the only people that really know you well are probably the hiring manager and may a few of the other designers or other colleagues who interviewed you. But other than that, you're an unknown quantity to everyone else in the, your team or your company. Even if you get a nice introduction email or something like that, or the boss kind of like, you know, through a Zoom call or, or in person, right? You know, back pre-COVID days, they still don't know you. And so it's hard to trust you. And so when you start looking at these, these other three, exploring questions, explaining benefits, you know, using their language, become social, take people out, you know, out to lunch uh, or, you know, like just have a con hallway conversations or maybe, you know, like chat conversation, things like that. Get them to know you as a person because, you know, as you start solving problems and you start working together, of course, your reputation improves. And then as you get promoted or things like that, you know, seniors and I mean, I challenge senior designers, senior product managers, you know, leads. Remember back when you were first starting out, or even if you're a senior and you work, you move, change companies, and now you're in a new company for the first time. You know, even if you a good reputation came with you, they you're still not known quality, right? People still don't know you, and so think about you know your strategies of how you get to know people personally. And there's a lot of like you know, I don't want to say like you know, people need to like you is I guess is the best way of saying it in order to trust you. And they have to know that, you know, the things you're going to do are going to help them with the things that they need to have done. And so, you know, w when you do these things, of course, then you start to find champions. And, you, and that's the thing you should always be seeking out is it's not just you or the design team advocating for, you know, customer experience and user experience. It's, it's, it should be everyone in the company. And the more champions and coalitions you can find in other disciplines like devs, the better off all that's going to be and your job's going to get easier. Uh, for me, I have two, uh, well, I used to, I had two great people I used to work with, Ovi and Polypy, and they were both developers, but they were both champions of design. And you know, through, I guess, rapport and their own interest, they often would help me, you know, advocate the designs I was trying to make to the dev managers and other management. And so it wasn't just, you know, the design team advocating for these things, you know, through QA team and developers like Ovi and Volvi, you know, it made it strength. It made the strength of the argument better. And so, you know, that's, that's the, I would say the key thing, you know, in all this as a strategy is get to know the people you work with, understand their motivations and, you know, use them I mean, you know, not manipulate, but use them to help you advocate, you know, your designs. And so the numbers, as I said before, like game theory is based on mathematics. And so the numbers allow for algorithms to become predictability. And so when we talk about the, uh, the CI analyst, you know, Bruce Bueno de Mesquita, there's, he used a lot of algorithms and game theory to predict outcomes. And so here, uh, you know, these, some of the algorithms and just some of the observation and research we've done, you know, these numbers represent a prediction of possible outcomes. And of course, zero is bad. You know, it's never going to happen. Uh, one, you know, is, is bad too, but eight's the best. And so when we look at these, uh, we're gonna, you know, to simplify the table here, let's get rid of the first one because that never works. And so now I have this game, this what's called a five by five game. And this, you know, you can see like if you hear these particular items or something similar to this, and I think there was a poll too with this, and then you look at the five you know, strategies you have, this is generally based on research how, how well the outcome is going to come. And so exploring the benefits of design to people, understand their motivations, you know, kind of helps with this, don't care about design. And finding a champion you know, has very optimal outcome to you know, devs or others saying this design's harder, this one's easier. You know, because you're thinking about now that they're motivated to do the design, you can kind of turn that on its head. And so if we go back to the Nash equilibrium. Uh, at the end of the day, your colleagues, this is their fallback. This is their Nash equilibrium in yellow here, amber, is, you know, this is always what they're going to fall back to. And this is the one thing with anyone you interact with, you know, socially or professionally, this is always where their head's at. It's like, you know, they're concerned about their own personal lives, their own personal problems, their, you know, maybe professional problems and professional lives. So if you always play to this as a strategy, you know, this is your optimal strategy as well to, you know, to go against. 
So, let's, so and, 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 and in, you know, the important thing is don't ever just jump on a soapbox and say, I'm the designer, I understand humans. I'm all, you know, everything I say is right. You know, it all has to always be about the designer, you know, what's best for the customer, which is true, but it's something that becomes very repetitive. And if you parrot it and you, you know, with ego or just like this, you become a very easy target to ignore and people will ignore you. And, you know, you won't have the success that you'll hopefully have and your job will be a whole lot harder in your company or organization. So, you know, as, as we end, uh, these are some great books. Uh, generally when I talk, I always like to give out books because I read a lot and, you know, I, you know, all these books, uh, this last one's sort of new is a friend. Of, uh, so the last one, I'll just going to throw out because he's a friend of mine, Mario van der Muen, but this is a fantastic book about thinking about design sort of in a non-intuitive way in a counterintuitive way. And of course the other books, I'm sure the one in the middle is familiar to a lot of people. Um, but you know, there's a, just some of many great books on strategy and understand and design. And with that, I uh, thank you very much for allowing me to talk today. And if you want to reach out to me um, on LinkedIn and Instagram, you know, and hope, you know, and I'll just give a quote from my, uh, one of my favorite philosophers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. That was a very uh, enlightening session and uh, very interesting. Audience, please go ahead and ask your questions in the Q&A window or the comment sections on LinkedIn. Okay, yeah, we've got one. Uh, how can we use explore with questions in easy to ignore and Nash equilibrium? Uh, I guess I'm trying to understand, hesitating for a moment as I understand the question. So, uh, do you want to, is the idea to explore with the question uh, specifically with Nash equilibrium? Is that the idea of the question? Uh, because the Nash, the, the Nash equilibrium is simply the, the point you're trying to get to. Uh, and so by, you know, it's like the optimal result. So exploring with questions specifically, uh, you know, it, it's very contextual. I mean, generally like how I would start out is just get to know the person. You know, and the same as like if you met somebody, say university or on this, you know, in a cafe or something like that as a friend, you know, and you're, or, you know, even like dating, you know, when you start out with either in person or online dating, you know, you start to ask questions about the person and get to understand, you know, get to know them. And by getting to know them, you know, and then follow up questions, you know, in a sense, you're just trying to make a friend. I mean, obviously social professional, you know, there's a bit of a separation, but the, the techniques are the same, you know, that you just, you want to like get to know them personally and figure out where you can connect, where you can bond. And, you know, and that'll help you get to the Nash equilibrium then, because you'll start to think about, as you know, who they are as a person, you know, it, and of course it's not hundred percent absolute. You could, you know, get to know somebody and find out they're a real curmudgeon, you know, and very difficult. But a lot of times as you get to know people and they get to know you because you offer up, you know, semi-personal, things you know you just start to build a bond and then connect and then that'll help you you know you'll and that way you also find allies and champions to kind of help you you know get to that point okay uh we have another question here how does scores from the last screen influence decision or how to interpret the scores um uh pardon you said course the scores. The scores. How discourse. does? Yeah, oh, the dis scores. Oh, discourse. No, the scores, as in when you had the table with the oh. scores on it, with the one to ten. Ah, scores. Um, so the the scores are. The the numbers were chosen specifically. Um, Fibonacci sequence or and then they also align pretty well to sprint you know agile planning where one was you know to eight kind of like you know one being an hour and then eight being a two-week full sprint uh, so the numbers themselves are arbitrary but they represent specific you know in terms of a scale but they represent the probable outcomes by employing one strategy against you know a counter strategy 
uh, you know, like what's the best course of action, uh, you know, against certain, certain excuses or certain things you're going to hear from other player strategies. Uh, hope that answered the question. And so like eight was the best and like the best possible outcome. And, and always, you know, Oh, again, nothing's ever absolute, but, you know, found through research and found through experimentation that if you got to know people and you built a coalition, it was easier for devs, if, for example, to argue to other devs about implementing the design, because then you, you sort of took yourself out of the equation and that helped, you know, significantly because then, you know, they're kind of having it out. And obviously you can have many, many champions, but if, if there's budgets and there's, there's other issues, uh, like I said, nothing's absolute, but that, that's kind of where the scores are. And, and, you know, one was like the worst five was like in the middle. Right. Uh, another one for you. When we need to talk their language, we need to understand the context and immediate tasks on hand. But some teams may be opaque. How to deal with information asymmetry while we try to reach Nash equilibrium? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a difficulty, certainly. And which, for my, my approach, this would be, you know, don't look at it as a whole team. Start to, I don't say, in a military terms, pick people off, so to speak. Like, uh, yeah, it's going to start to try to figure out the people that are most approachable. Because the way I look at this whole way I understand the question is, it's a lot like when you walk into a room full of people you don't know for the first time. You know, and, and they're all engaged in conversations and many of them probably know each other. And it's hard to kind of like break into that, you know. And so seek out maybe the you know, strategies of like one person alone or maybe two people, you know, and decide if that's more comfortable. Or if it's more comfortable to go into a group of six people, uh, yeah, is, that, is that a kind of idea? And you have to, in the sense of like, ask questions and start to try to, you know, find one or two people that you, you know, that you're comfortable with. And it's turning stones. That way you can kind of start penetrating into that um, opaqueness, you know, and it, it's going to take time. And, and it, you know, again, in a professional situation, there could often be very tight deadlines and people are running a lot, but it's something that's going to happen over time, you know, as you start to talk to people. And so just take, approach it with little bits of the time, little steps versus trying to like jump right in to sort of, you know, dispel that opaqueness. You know, okay. and, and sometimes your manager is your ally. Sometimes it could be another colleague. Sometimes it could be a dev QA, you know, and then that'll help with the opaqueness because yeah, often institutions may not be as forthcoming with information as you need to, to best do your job. And so, it, you know, it falls back to asking questions. Um, right. Uh, another one, this strategy making is cool, is a cool understanding for companies starting to think design. Please tell us how the game dynamics play a part in user or customer centric organizations like Apple and Amazon. Yeah, I think they still apply uh, because even in, in mature design companies like Apple and Amazon, uh, there are still, and people still have motivations and they still have, you know, the things that they care most about. And there is a luxury that they're more design centric uh, but I've not yet met anyone who said that all the work they did all the time was immediately accepted, you know, and, and if that does happen, you know, fantastic, of course, but uh, I think there's slightly different struggles, but the strategy is still the same, you know, and especially, and maybe the, maybe it turns, maybe instead of it being a, an opposite, you know, discipline, maybe it's within your own discipline. Like when you do wall reviews and you, you pitch your ideas, you know, I mean, if, if your ideas are always immediately accepted, you know, bully for you. But I uh, really, for people, I think a lot of times there's, there's right. Design is very iterative. And so even in our own sessions, you know, and if you're finding that your designs are constantly rejected, either internal team or external, uh, you know, then, then sometimes, you know, like a friend of mine was going through that, that issue that no matter what she did for work and, oh, and it was good, uh, it was constantly rejected and it's mostly because it was a very top-down team organization and they had their own way of doing things. And 
it was hard for her to understand that. In fact, I, I, I can't say she's a success story right now. She's actually looking for a different team to work with. But the, because, the, you know, it was, it was very hard, to, even though they're a mature design organization, it was very hard for her, either personality wise or, you know, work wise to kind of get into that flow that whatever they were looking for, you know, and, uh, and it, it, sometimes it just comes down to personality. And so you have to think about, you know, outside of design professionalism, like it's just socially, or is it a good match for you? Is that team or that company, if you're, if you're running into issues? Um, and sometimes, you know, it's just best to, you know, move on. But, but the strategies can be the same. Right. And uh, we have a word here from one of the participants. As a UI visual designer, the pain points resonate with my personal experience. The following framework was enlightening. And uh, there's one more question here. When you are a startup with next to nothing reputation and you have built a product that you think will solve a person's problem, how do you approach that person using this, using this theory for a good outcome? Uh, this is, yeah, this is where like, because you don't have a reputation yet and you're an unknown quantity, this is where it becomes very important to build a rapport first. You know, it, it's like any uh, sales, you know, sales, uh, you can't just go into a, a room and say, you know, hey, who wants, especially something like insurance, uh, at least in the United States, you know, insurance salesmen have a very bad reputation, uh, mostly because nobody ever wants to think about insurance and, you know, nobody wants to be sold anything. But a lot of times more successful, you know, sales people, or in the case of you're in a startup and you're trying to pitch your idea, which probably, you know, hopefully will change the world. Uh, it starts small. It starts to get people to know you personally. And when someone knows you personally, they'll be much more receptive to your ideas, you know, good or bad, uh, because you're building these personal connections. And that's, that's the one thing. And I'm glad you asked the question too, is because this is the, the, the one thing, you know, I was trying to stress that Lumen and I were trying to stress this talk is that you have to build a reputation. People have to connect with people, you know, and I can't just be end users you know, or customers or your immediate design colleagues. Of course, often it is, we, you know, we have the same things we want to do for our users and our customers. We have to do it with each other, you know, and remember the human side of it, social connection, social cognitivity. And then that'll help, you know, pitch your ideas. And, you know, uh, Bill Gates once said, you know, pitch his idea at several like 800 or 80,000 people you know, and then as it got down to it, like a hundred people wanted to invest in, or said they were interested and then only two actually invested with Bill Gates, you know, and, and of course now the rest is history, but he had to turn over that 80,000, you know, and possibly more, you know, and so just remember, it's not you personally, it's a numbers game, but just try to build relationships with people as you would your friends, as you would, you know, with, you know, and, and social situations, take that same social kind of friend building ideas you know, with your potential customers and clients. Right. Uh, one last question I think we'll take, but uh, before that, the attendee says, thank you for your valuable se session. And uh, the question is, in the recent times when you were connected with the designers and the team virtually, so how would you apply the strategic games with some non-government organizations? Yeah, this is... This is good too. Is it's something I've been thinking about a lot in, in practice as well because of our remoteness. Uh, some people are more comfortable in the room. Some people are more comfortable, you know, remotely. But the, to me, the basic strategy applies of just connecting. And and one of the things that I found has worked for me is I I found myself chatting with a lot of people more, or you know, setting up a, a conversation, you know. Like I've, I've asked colleagues, hey, do you want to do like a virtual coffee chat or do you want to like, you know, do that and say a Zoom call or, you know, just chat with people and just ask them how they're doing, you know, and and try to don't don't wait, you know, and, and since it's very tricky in a professional situation, because if you're in a meeting or something like that, you, you don't want to get off into a tangent of small talk uh, because, you know, the meeting may be very set, you know, with a set goals. But if there are opportunities to, you know, small talk or ask people how they're doing or, you know, how, how, especially now with COVID and like remote, you know, everyone's remote, uh, those kind of things become much more important. And so that will help you pay dividends long-term in terms of like your actual work. You know, if you do that and, and you respect, of course, people's time, but then ask them, 
hey, do you want to get together for virtual coffee or do you want to get together for, you know, virtually for, you know, this or that. And I found that to be a great success, um, you know, and a lot of my friends and colleagues have, you know, said the same and, you know, and, um, and also look for signs, you know, if you start to talk to people and they, they seem distracted or they seem like they really need to go and then they drop hints about their time, of course, be respectful of that. You know, uh, maybe a good example is if you ask somebody how they're doing and they're like, yeah, yeah I'm good. And then, you know, something like I, I have to run now because I have another meeting. Don't press them with another question. You know, maybe say, yeah, I, OK, I understand. Hey, hey, do you mind like getting together for coffee or something, a virtual coffee? Or do you mind getting together? Yeah, I know you're busy now, but hey, do you want to like meet up and chat? And I've I found that you know, people are much more receptive to that, especially now because, you know, everyone's social distancing. So I would say that, you know, I would go with that. Great. So in view of the time constraints, we'll have to end the Q&A here. Thanks for the participation audience and for a very uh, lot of question filled session there. And um, for any other further questions, you can connect with Jeffrey over LinkedIn or other mediums. Okay, now for the champion of curiosity. Uh, Jeffrey, you need to now, uh, but it, uh, you need to now pick the question that you thought uh, was the best. So then uh, the winner will take away a free course of their choice, digital course of their choice. So what did you think was the best question that was asked? Um, um, now give me a second, because they were all very, very good. Uh, uh, the, the two that stood out to me, uh, the startup question and, and the last one. Um, actually, the, I think the last three. Um, but I want to say, let's go with, I want to say because of the particular situation we all find ourselves in virtually, I'll go with the last one. The one about, you know, how, you know, we're answered about the coffee. You know, questions like, how do you like build rapport over Zoom? Or how do you do your work? you know, when you're sort of abstracted social distancing wise. So this is basically for uh, next to nothing reputation and you have to build a product for a good outcome? I, I think so. I, uh, yeah, it, it, was, it, was, it was the last question that was asked. Oh, the, the last question was about the, the, where you're connected with the designers and team virtually. So yeah, how would you yes. apply these strategic games? Yeah. All right. Yes. Uh, Great, congratulations. And uh, the winner, we will uh, get in touch with you uh, later again. Okay, now we have, thank you very much, Jeffrey. We have enjoyed having you with us. It has been a complete pleasure. Please, just a moment. Please accept the certificate of appreciation from the Institute. The QR code and the certificate will take you to a dedicated Hall of Fame page created for you with a recording of this session. Please share it with your network. We'll be sharing the webinar recording on our YouTube channel as well. Excellent. Thank you very much, all. It was a pleasure. Thank you again and appreciate you taking the time off for throwing more light on the subject. Uh, audience, please share your feedback on today's session via the, via the poll on screen. And thank you very much for joining us again. It was great interacting with you all. Do not forget to register for the webinar tomorrow. Thank you everybody for joining in. It was great interacting with all of you again. With that note, I end tonight's session. Happy learning and stay skilled. Have a great night. Thank you once again, Jeffrey. Thank you. Good night.